Hi Year 10 and welcome to um, guidance I'm going to give you on the work that you did in English hopefully last week on questions 1, 2 and 3 of paper 2. So I'm going to divide this into two separate narrated powerpoints. Um, one will be on the text 127 hours and the other will be on the text from Love Letters of the Great War. And the intention is that I'm going to try and talk you through what looks good, what works well um, and what you need to be aiming for as well as um, looking at some example answers and that sort of thing. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at 127 hours between a rock and a hard place by Aaron Ralston. So I think by now you've probably had a chance to um, read the text yourself. Um, I have included some links here uh, which will give you just a bit of a flavour um, of the text and a little bit more of an idea about um, what happens uh, and it might just help you kind of feel a little bit more engaged with the text um, to start with. Um, obviously when you get in an exam you're not going to get the chance to look at any YouTube clips but uh, for the purposes of kind of keeping you engaged with what the text is about and getting you to understand some of the ideas, having a quick look at these clips might be useful. Okay, so this is the first extract and on paper two, the first three questions will always be on extract one. Um, there's a few things that it's worth us having a think about before we um, go too far with this. Uh, so if you look at the top of the screen, you can see that um, the text in italic always gives you a little bit of information about what the text is and where it's from. So this is extract from 127 hours between a rock and a hard place by Aaron Ralston. And it tells us that it's written in 2004. And it also gives us the information that he's an American climber. Often what these little extracts do is they kind of use the first three lines, again the information in italics, just telling you a little bit more about the piece and this can be useful because it can kind of orientate you so that you understand what the text is about. So we've got the information that Rolston goes hiking and climbing in a canyon. Whilst climbing down a narrow canyon, a boulder crushes his right hand against the canyon wall. He had not informed anyone of his hiking plans. So that's really just helpful in terms of giving us an idea about what the text is about. Um, if you haven't read the text yet, um, then I would suggest that you pause this slideshow now and take a moment or a few minutes just to read the text. I'm going to assume that you've done that. Um, I do want to just sort of go over with you a couple of other things. So you'll get, if the, the exam board will tend to uh, provide you with a little, little glossary. So if there's any particularly unusual words, they will normally be um, pointed out for you uh, at the bottom of, that can be useful. And let's just go over the blue box. So one of the really important things about paper two is that it is non fiction. That means that these texts are uh, based on true events. So often the writers, in fact always the writers, are real people. Okay, so the sorts of texts that you're likely to get for paper two are things like letters, journals, extracts from autobiographies, um, sometimes articles, that sort of thing. So none of it is made up. So it's really important that you refer to the writer normally by their name. Okay, they're not an author. They and it's not based on imaginary events. The things that are described in these extracts are real. Okay, one of the things that comes hand in hand with that is you need to be able to think carefully about who the writer was intending to read the text that they've written. So sometimes if it's a diary entry, they might have just been writing it for themselves uh, and not really intending to uh, affect a particular reader. Or if it's a part of an autobiography, then they were hoping that you were going to be interested in their life story. But if it's a letter, then 
Originally, it's intended for the person who that letter is addressed to. So it's important for you to have a think about um, who the original intended audience was. Also have a little look at the date because that can help you and it helps you kind of put a text into context. So in the exam, normally you'll get a text that was written in the last 20 years, in this century, and one that was written in the last century. Uh, and that can be helpful just in helping you understand what you're looking at and just have a bit of an idea about what life might have been like. like. So this text is quite a modern, contemporary text. OK, so we're not going to spend too long going over questions one and two today. Um, the key things are, these are really straightforward select and retrieve marks, okay? So these is, this is like your warm-up, basically. So you are given an instruction uh, from lines 5 to 13, give two examples that suggest that Aaron Ralston thinks that he has secured his position well. And what they're looking for in this question is literally you're selecting and retrieving the words which show that okay so literally it should take you about a minute to do this question if that okay so um, I have I have cut out with my snipping tool the actual part of the text that you need to look in okay that's pretty much the only thing that you can get wrong for this question is if you look in the wrong part of the line so it says lines 5 to 13 and you've got to look for lines 5 to 13 and I've highlighted the right answers here. So basically, there's normally about five or six correct answers and you only need to give two of them. So it's pretty straightforward. And there you go, this is the mark scheme. So as long as you had written one of these words down, lock tight, hold support, confirming or fully, you would have got the marks. Um, one of the other things that sometimes people do wrong is they write too much. So do try to just write one or two words for this question for each answer. Don't be tempted to copy out huge long chunks of the text because you might lose the marks that way. Okay, and question two is really similar. From lines 20 to 25, identify two things happening to Aaron Ralston. Uh, you may use your own words or quotations from the text. So again, this is really simple. You can't really get it wrong. The only thing that you can do wrong really is by writing out too much. So you need to look at the right part of the text and then make sure that you select some details. So on this slide, I've cut out for you the bit of text that you need to look at and you just need to pick out um, two things that happen to Aaron Ralston. So um, I'm looking through here, the next three seconds play out at a tenth of their normal speed. Time dilates as if I'm dreaming and my reactions decelerate. So his reactions slow down. In slow motion, the rock smashes my left hand against the south wall. So the rock smashes his hand. Uh, his eyes register the collision. He looks at the collision. Uh, and I yank my left arm back as the rock ricochets. The boulder then crushes my right hand and ensnares my right arm at the wrist. So his right hand is crushed. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, the wall, blah, blah, blah. Um, tearing the skin off the lateral side of my form, forearm. So again, there's going to be five, six correct answers most of the time for this question. You have just got to select two of the things that happen to him. Let's have a look at the answers. There you go. As long as you'd written down two of these things, you'd have been fine. So the only things you can really get wrong with this question are looking at the wrong part of the text or writing too much. So that's all. Let's have a look at question three. Okay, so question three, this is the first um, big question on the exam paper. And for this question, uh, you will be given three pages in your exam booklet. So if you've printed off the booklet at home, uh, you will see that there's quite a lot of space there. Okay, so people often ask me, how much should I write for question three? Well, I think the best thing is really for you to 
to, to be aiming to write a good amount in about 20 minutes. So I think realistically, a page and a half to two pages is what you ought to be aiming for. You've just started to learn about how to answer this question. So to start with, you might struggle to write that much, but that's how much you want to aim for. Some people obviously have got much bigger handwriting than others and they may need to fill the three pages and if you want it in the exam you can ask for extra paper but for most people I would say one and a half to two sides ought to be enough for you to answer this question. Okay a really really important thing is that you must write about both language and structure okay if you don't write about both language and structure you will only manage to get six marks out of 15 so that's really important you've got to talk about both language and structure you might remember from um, English language paper one you're asked to write about language and structure and it's a really similar question to that um, but on this question you're being asked to look at the whole text whereas on paper one question three you're you're just given a selection of lines okay so let's have a think about what language and structure actually is so a little bit of a reminder here um what's language and what's structure okay so they've changed the exam paper recently so it does give you these helpful little bullet points to, to help you write along the right lines but essentially when you're asked to write about language you need to look at the words okay so look for interesting words look for words that seem a bit unusual and the key thing is you must comment on their effect okay uh, sometimes in non-fiction texts you can see things like similes metaphors and personification but they're a little bit less common in these texts than they are in fiction texts so other things that you could look out for might include alliteration uh, you might look for things which indicate tone whether it's formal or informal do they use any slang is there any sort of jargon like technical words um, that are specific to a particular hobby or pastime uh, is there an example of direct address this list is not exhaustive there are lots and lots of things the key thing that you need to keep in mind is you're, you've got to try and comment on the words, okay? So with structure, structure is essentially how texts are put together. So what they look like and how they flow and how they are ordered. So look for short and long sentences. Why has the writer chosen to use a short sentence at a particular moment? What is the effect? Or why has the writer chosen to use a long sentence? What is the effect? Similarly, you need to look for short and long paragraphs. So it's the same thing. Why did they choose to have a particularly long paragraph? Why did they choose a short paragraph? Easy things that you can look for when you're thinking about structure are repetition um, and also lists. Those are just nice and easy to spot. Um, We've already mentioned briefly the order of ideas and the sh shifts or changes. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, you could look for punctuation and its effect. Um, generally, I would say look for things like exclamation marks or question marks, possibly dashes. Looking for things like commas or apostrophes is going to do you no good whatsoever. So don't even bother really. Uh, you could have a think about whether it's in past or present tense. Okay, so here's the text and we are looking again at um, how the writer uses language and structure to interest and engage the reader. And question three will nearly always be phrased that way. Um, when it says how the writer interests engaged and engages the reader i think sometimes students struggle with it because they find the text a bit boring it basically is kind of you know why have they chosen the words that they've chosen where are they interesting where do they grab your attention uh, what's worth commenting on okay so 
on the next slide, I've already made some annotations uh, to give you the idea of the sorts of things that you could pull out. And I've looked just at the very opening paragraph. So here you see, this is the very opening paragraph. And um, what I've done for you is I've added in annotations. The green boxes here tend to be things that are to do with structure. And the peach boxes here are the things that are to do with language. OK, um, what I've done is where I have written in black font, that's me pointing out the idea or the device. Uh, and then where I've changed the colour of the font to blue, that's me commenting on the effect. So these are the sorts of things that you might choose to pull out or to comment on. OK, so the text opens in media ray, it's a Latin term, and it just means it's in the middle of things, which is kind of inevitable, really, because it's an extract, it's from the middle of the book. Um, he says that uh, just below the ledge where I'm standing is a stone the size of a large bus tire. So I've pulled that image out because most of us have seen a bus and it gives us an idea of scale, and it's quite a relatable image, we can relate to it nice and easily. One of the interesting things about this text is it uses first person and it's written in present tense. So he uses I throughout and it is very engaging for us because we're encouraged to adopt his point of view. Um, we have here, he says, if I can step onto it, then I'll have a nine foot height to descend. So he uses the idea of if, which is a conditional term, and it introduces just a slight idea of tension. If he can, he'll be safe, but if he can't, then he won't. Um, what else could we pick up? We could look at the way that he uses jargon. Uh, there's lots of words here, and the glossary um, helpfully explains a number of them, but it makes it sound like he's quite an experienced climber. He talks about traversing and chimneying, uh, and even when he's talking about the rocks, he talks about the lip and the overhang and the drop off. So it sounds like he's quite an experienced climber. We trust him that he's OK and he knows what he's doing. But of course, he doesn't. Um, there's a few other things uh, that I've pulled out here. Um, frankly, I'm getting bored of the sound of my own voice. So I'm going to let you have a read of those um, and see how you feel about them. Hopefully this slide has just given you an, an idea of the sorts of detail that you need to look at when you're looking at a text. So what I've done on this slide is I've just um, snipped out the second half of the text with the idea that you could have a go at looking at this yourself uh, so that you can try to look at this part of the extract in the same detail that I looked at the first part of the extract. So what could you pull out? So I suggest that you take five minutes to make some notes on this uh, and come up with um, some ideas on it. The answers or some of the answers are on the next slide and of course if you're really stuck you can uh, skim through and have a look at those but it's really good for you to do the thinking yourself and on your own terms. Okay, so I'm just going to explain some of these for you a little bit. Um, the, the second half of the extract starts with as I. Uh, so just that clause, that subordinate clause opening there creates the idea that it's all happening at once. It all happens uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and in fact, the way that the sentence is structured here is can you see that it's one long sentence the first four lines oh no the first the first four lines are made up of two multi-clawed complex sentences uh, and this creates the idea of lots of things are happening very very quickly uh, over a very quick period so the, the way that the sentences layer up helps to create that impression other things that we might be able to pick up 
um, are, for example, he talks about, um, he says, as I dangle. That word, dangle, it sounds uh, that he is in a precarious position. And of course, that is what happens. He ends up very, very badly injured. Uh, we could pick out, for example, the scraping quake uh, that his that he, um, that he hears, uh, and it catches the sound of the moment that the rock shifts. Um, we could look at, for example, uh, I really like this bit here when it talks about when I look up, the backlit stone falling towards my head consumes the sky. It almost sounds like a, like a kind of cartoon character's perspective. It really captures this terrifying idea that he's lying on the floor and looking up and the, the stone is um, hurrying towards him and beginning to block out the sky. And it's interesting that it talks about the, the rock consuming the sky. So it's almost as if the, the rock is personified. And again, he... He drops his first person narration uh, for the opening of the next sentence when he says, fear shoots my hands over my head. He's not saying, I'm scared, so I put my hands over my head. It's fear that personified that directs that sentence. Um, we could look at the fact that uh, he uses lots of time phrases. So the next three seconds, time dilates. So it's this idea again of... Um, time slowing down and lots and lots of things packing very quickly into a short amount of time. Um, we could look at this word, I yank my left arm back, uh, it suggests that it's impulsive and quick and panicky. Um, one of the things that it's really easy to look out for when you're asked to write about language and structure is to try and look for really super short sentences or super long ones because that will allow you to write about structure. Uh, so we've got this one at the end of the second, or in fact, it'll be the third paragraph, then silence. Um, it emphasises, you know, that a terrible thing has happened and it's a life-changing moment. Um, you could pick out the violent verbs that are used throughout. Um, one of the things when you're talking about structure is try to think about what has changed over the course of the text as a whole. Uh, so at the start of the piece, if we went back to the extract on the previous slide, um, he sounded very confident and very sure with all those confident verbs like tightly and firmly and lock and hold. Uh, but by the end of the extract, that's completely changed. So there's lots and lots of things that you could have picked out. Um, just to show you, these are my scrawly notes that I put together for, um, just for my benefit really, when I was thinking, gosh, if I was answering this question, what, what would I pull out? Um, so, you know, it's a good idea when you are in an exam or when you're trying to answer a question on any text, it is a really good idea for you to write on the paper or use a highlighter. It's just a good way of organising your thoughts and getting um, your ideas together. Um, remember, in the exam, you're going to have about 20 minutes to write about the language and structure. You will not be able to cover everything. Okay, It is a good idea to try and make some points about early on in the extract and some points about towards the end of the extract. And other than that, you just need to make sure that you cover language and structure. So on the next slide, we're going to just have a little look at the mark scheme. OK, so this is how the mark scheme looks. Um, basically, the sorts of things that they expect you to have said about language are listed on the top left hand side of the screen. And the sorts of things that you could have said about structure are listed on the bottom left hand side of the screen. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, you've got what I would call the kind of overarching or generic mark scheme. And this will be the same for every question three that you do on paper one or in fact on paper two. Um, so the key thing is, as I've mentioned before, you have to talk about both language and structure. If 
you only talk about language or you only talk about structure, you're not going to get the marks, okay? Uh, and then there's kind of keywords here as well. So for the lowest marks, it's limited. So you're only going to say one or two things. Uh, for level two, you do comment on the text. There is some comment uh, and you're beginning to show some use of references. In level three, you're explaining. Uh, so you, it's you're pointing out things that in quite a straightforward way. Whereas in level four, the key terminology changes to explore. So it's thinking a little bit more kind of openly and uh, beginning to consider things in a little bit more depth. And level five is about um, being analytical, really, really looking closely in detail at the various elements. Um, now let's have a look at some of the example answers. Okay, so this is quite a low example. I think you can probably tell just from the, um, the length of it. It's quite brief. So in the extract, the character is in a really scary part because he is stuck fast. He gets his hand smashed, as it says in the text, that the rock smashes my left hand against the south wall. He uses language when he says that there are round rocks below. This is alliteration, misspelled, uh, and it's really effective and it sticks in your head. Okay, so whilst this isn't a fantastic response, it's not awful by any means. Um, it does use some quotes. Uh, it does mention that alliteration is used uh, and it's beginning to think about um, the effect on the reader when it talks about it sticking in your head. Um, the candidate has referred to the writer as a character, which suggests to me that they don't really understand Okay, that this is not a story, it's, it's actually something that's happened to somebody in real life. So this answer would get three out of 15, I would say. Okay, let's look at our second exemplar. Okay, let's have a look at this one. Uh, the writer attempts to engage the reader by using descriptive language. For example, a stone the size of a large bus tire. This helps to draw the reader in and allows them to picture the scale of the rock being talked about and that he is seeing. The writer also writes in first person, so you get to really relate to him, and this makes the reader interested. The writer also uses alliteration, which would have been used in this because the vocabulary is catchy and sticks in your head, like rounded rocks. Okay, I'm just going to pause there for a minute. So, um, I think that their first comment about the um, a stone the size of a large bus tire is quite good because it explains that it helps us see the scale. Uh, they are using a reasonable amount of subject terminology, first person and alliteration. Um, we get a little bit vague with the sticks in your head, uh, but we're, it's going quite well. The writer uses lots of very precise descriptions giving dimensions like nine foot height and tenth of normal speed so you get a clear idea of what's happening. The writer sounds very careful about things which makes us feel sorry for him when there is an accident because he didn't deserve for this to happen. For example he says that he does a kick at the boulder to test how, stu how stick it is and it's jammed tightly enough to hold my weight. This means that later it is a bit of a surprise and shock when the rock rolls onto him. Okay, here they are just beginning, beginning to address structure because they're talking about how it's a surprise and shock a bit later. So, so far I'm thinking this might nudge into a 7 out of 15. But then they, they really save it by uh, explicitly talking about structure in the next paragraph. The writer also uses structure really well. Hooray, they're talking about structure. Flowing fluently through each point, he makes changing it from him being really confident and sure about things to him being in a really terrible situation where he might die. It says at the end he is in agony and also in panic. I really like the fact that they've started to embed really short quotations. 
The writer used a variety of sentences really well to create a lot of different effects. My favourite bit was at the end, if the third paragraph, when he says, then silence. This is just after the bad, disastrous moment has happened and for a bit you wonder, even did he survive? Is he dead? Okay, so they did write about both language and structure, so I'm really pleased about that. I think they they kind of get a little bit confused, but obviously it's written in exam conditions. But this one would probably get eight, maybe nine out of 15 because they definitely write about both and they are beginning to explore and explain the ideas in a good level of depth and detail. Okay, so I'm sure just from squinting at the screen and seeing just how much is written here, um, you'll be able to tell immediately that this is a really good example. Um, this one was actually written by somebody who is in your year group and had sent their work in remotely to their teacher this week. Uh, so it's not one that I've shown off all my teacher skills on and written myself. It's one that actually has been written by one of your peers. Um, so let's have a little read through of it and look at what's really good about it. So Ralston engages the reader by manipulating emotive language to showcase the writer's emotions and pain throughout the extract. Right from the start of the extract, personal pronouns, I'm standing, are cleverly weaved through the text to indicate to the reader that this story is personal. Furthermore, the reader will read the extract as if they are the narrator. As I dangle, I feel, causing them to closely associate with the text as if becoming the protagonist and going on the journey as well. This is an effective technique used to engage the reader. Furthermore, the use of religious imagery highlights how extreme their pain was as good Christ, my hand, displays his utter shock and disbelief before the extreme pain hits them. Lastly, pain is illustrated through adjectives. The use of the adjective tearing in the phrase tearing the skin off the lateral side of my forearm exposes how violent this experience was and allows the reader to infer the amount of pain illustrating an extreme image. So I'm just going to pause there for a minute and tell you what I think uh, immediately is quite impressive about this response. So they have opened by using um, technical uh, reference terms in terms of the language. They've talked about emotive language, uh, they've talked about personal pronouns, they've talked about religious imagery, they've talked about adjectives. They have quoted really regularly but all of the quotations are quite short and embedded and linked very very uh, directly to what they are asserting about the text. Um, and I also really like the fact that lots of the things that they have uh, drawn upon for this opening paragraph are not just from the very opening of the extract but they also include references towards uh, the end of the extract so already I'm getting the idea that they're talking about the text or the extract as a whole. Let's carry on. So in addition suspense is built up through the use of time phrases in language. Creating suspense is a compelling technique to hook the reader as to engage them, they need to understand what's happening and feel empathy, close to anticipation, expectation, fear, concern and any other emotion that causes tension. Anticipation is built up by Rolston hinting that something risky may happen. In the line, it supports me but teeters slightly, the use of the adverb slightly hints that something bad may happen. This is also illustrated in the line, adjusting my grip with a, craping, with a scraping quake, the word quake hints that the writer is trembling from weakness and in result may fall. Lastly in the line, instantly I know this is trouble. It reveals what the reader feared and what the suspense is building up to. This allows the reader to be more engaged as they're feeling numerous emotions and want to know how the situation ends. As well as that, so by using the phrases, the next three seconds play out at a tenth of their normal speed, time dilates as if I'm dreaming and my reactions decelerate in slow motion. Suspense is built as the reader understands how dangerous the situation was and how it doesn't seem or want to seem real. Okay, I think this paragraph is really good. 
I think that their focus on language is still really good and they're beginning to veer into talking about structure. I think possibly they could have been a little bit more explicit about that. Uh, but then we get, it's almost as if the student who has written this has realised that themselves and then the opening of the next paragraph overtly addresses structure. Punctuation and varied lengths of sentences are clever ways to slow down and emphasise certain events taking place. This allows the reader to zoom in on certain parts and vividly illustrates the pain and extreme of the situation. The use of comma causes there to be pauses in the long sentences which slows down the pace of the extract. The use of commas are specifically placed in order to cause short pauses, not like a full stop, only slow down the pace to make the event seem more intense as shown in the phrase, instantly, I know this is trouble, and instinctively, I let go of the rotating boulder. As well as that, short sentences such as, fear sh shoots over my head, then silence, and good Christ my hand, showcase and emphasise tension, and make a bigger impact on the reader. On the other hand, lists are then used to present how much is happening in a small amount of time, which contrasts. This is seen in the boulder crushes my right hand and ensnares my right arm, arm at the wrist, palm in, thumb up, fingers extended, which is effectively used to show the position the, the writer is currently in. Overall, language and structure are successfully used to interest and engage the reader. So... This is a very, very strong response with a really, really good focus on language, particularly in the opening two paragraphs. And then uh, they really, really nail their discussion about structure in the third paragraph. And they keep their focus on interesting and engaging the reader throughout. Uh, so I would say that this response would get 14, possibly even 15 marks out of 15. So I hope that's been useful. I'm going to record a second narrated uh, slideshow um, to help you with um, the, the uh, Burt Bailey's letter to his wife, um, with taking some similar approaches that you can see uh, how you can access the best marks for the paper.